listening to the Mike Church Show on Sirius Patriot 144 and XM America Rights 166. We're going to talk about the Supreme Court here for just a minute. Before I put Dr. Gutsman on the line here, I want him to hear this because even though he has much more calm demeanor than I, he may not be able to contain himself. Do you, can you cue up the Obama Supreme Court montage of what makes a great Supreme Court justice, and then we'll get Dr. Gutsman's sage take on it, Halle Berry Lou, you. Listen to this, and then some my rest of you, too. We need somebody who's got the heart to recognize, the, the empathy to recognize what it's like to be uh, a, a, a young teenage mom. Uh, the empathy to understand really? what it's like to be poor or African American or gay or disabled or really? old. Senator McCain has made it abundantly clear that he wants to appoint justices like Roberts and Alito and that he hopes to see Roe overturned. I stand by my votes against confirming Justices Roberts and Alito. I made it equally clear that I will never back down from making sure that women have their reproductive rights here in this country. My first criteria is to make sure that these are people who are capable and competent uh, and that they are interpreting the law and 95 percent of the time uh, yeah, the law is so clear that it's just a matter of applying the law yeah, I'm not somebody who believes in a bunch of judicial lawmaking are there I members think, think, uh, justices right now uh, upon whom you would model you would look at who do you like well you know I think uh, actually Justice Breyer Justice Ginsburg are very sensible judges right. I think that uh, Justice Souter who was a Republican <laughs> appointee uh, is a sensible judge what, what you're looking for is somebody who's going to apply the law where it's clear. Now, there's going to be those 5% of cases or 1% of cases where the law isn't clear. And the judge then has to bring in his or her own perspectives, his, his uh, ethics, his or her moral bearings. And in those circumstances, what I do want is a judge who is sympathetic enough to those who are on the outside, those who are vulnerable, those who are powerless, those who can't have access to political power and as a consequence can't protect themselves from being uh, oh, uh, from being Stop dealt it. with sometimes unfairly. My head off. Stop it for crying out loud. All right, Dr. Kevin Gutsman wrote a couple of books on this subject, Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. Who killed the Constitution, Dr. Gutsman? First of all, good morning, welcome. And does any of that sound like criteria for Supreme Court justice in your mind? Uh, well, I infer that he thinks the person has to be living and breathing. So I guess to that extent I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> so you agree in the living and breathing part? I think he and I are right on the same page. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you had ever heard those uh, those clips that we played, and we called them all together from over the last year or so. Um, uh, but does that sound like the recipe for a uh, another Justice Souter, or is it going to be even worse, uh, Justice Earl Warren? I do think that there's every chance that what we get will be even worse than Souter. Yes. And uh, the the in your opinion, now uh, you study these things. Was Souter's worst decision the Kelo case, or was it Planned Parenthood versus Casey? Was it Gore Bush? What do you think was his worst moment on the bench? Well, I think that none of these fellows who joined in the three-person um, uh, plurality decision in Planned Parenthood versus Casey is going to be able to escape uh, the ignominy that goes with being associated with that. I mean... Whatever you think of the outcome in the case, and I'm on record many times saying that uh, regulation of anything to do with sex is supposed to have been left by the Constitution to state governments, not right. supposed to be for federal courts. But uh, the, the thing that's really absurd about that case, uh, about the court's decision about Souter, Kennedy, and O'Connor, is they said, well, whenever we have a, an opinion from the court that provokes a political firestorm, we know that the court absolutely should not revisit its reasoning. Because if it ever were to reconsider what a lot of people think was an incorrect decision, it would undermine its own position in the structure of our government. And so just because we made this decision before and it was unpopular, we think that we should never revisit it. How's that for an argument? Well, doesn't it, now, now, correct me if I'm wrong. You're, you're the authority on this. Isn't that, doesn't that go back to the line of questioning that, uh, uh, that, that then 
I think it was um, was it Kennedy or Leahy? I'm trying to remember when Roberts was up for confirmation, and they hounded him for an entire day on this thing called Starry Decisis. Is that right. what you're talking about? Starry Decisis. Uh, that's another way to put it. Sure. Well, okay. The way your listeners can understand this is, beginning really in the 1950s, we had a revolution on the Supreme Court. We had essentially the Warren Court, as it's known, decide that it didn't care at all about precedents, and so. Uh, within about 15 years, the court overturned more decisions that it had overturned in its previous uh, 160 years of existence. And from that point on, people on the left in America decided that they believed in never overturning any precedents. So in other words, once they had substituted their own version of what a constitution ought to be for what the constitution actually had been for the previous 160 years, then they decided that stare decisis was a very important principle. And so you go to the Supreme Court, I'm, I'm sorry, you get nominated for the Supreme Court now, you're going to go in front of Senate liberals who are going to say, well, you believe in upholding precedents, right? And of course, what they mean is you believe in upholding what liberals beginning with the Warren Court did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in lieu of the actual Constitution that existed for the 160 years before that. Right. So, well, yes, Souter was a devotee of this idea, and he thought that the reason that it was essential was that the court had to have this, this prime position in American life, and the only way it was going to retain that and the only way people were going to continue to defer to the justices on these important social um, issues that the court keeps insinuating itself into deciding is if the court says essentially, look, we never make mistakes. And by the way, there was a there was a, a, a short story by Nietzsche about the Central Committee of the Communist Party and the KGB and the Soviet Union called "We Never Make Mistakes." So <laughs> um, I encourage anybody who's interested in good literature to go read Solzhenitsyn's We Never Make Mistakes. It actually has a lot in parallel with this attitude of these people on the Supreme Court. Well, let, let me ask you a next question of uh, Dr. Kevin Gutzman, who wrote a couple of books on the subject of the Constitution, a politically incorrect guide, and uh, who killed the Constitution here. Who was the last nominee that actually may have read the ratification debates and may have actually been what these guys like to brag and boast of, quote, a constructionist or originalist, end quote. Well, I do think that both um, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, when he was an Associate Justice, and the current Associate Justice Thomas have made an honest effort in this regard. Okay. Of course, their, their effort in that direction is crippled by the fact that their quote-unquote education uh, extends only to having gone to law school. So they're not really familiar with the making of the Constitution, but but they you know they have read the Federalist and they do know Mark, John Marshall's opinions and they do have some idea that the Constitution as it was created is actually different from Stare Decisis at the moment. So to that extent, you have to give them credit, even though you you know you wish they'd studied history instead of law. And so that we can be we can rest uh, very uh, very sure uh, assuredly, as you pointed out in, in our correspondence today that it doesn't matter who Obama picks, because they're all the same. If they've gone to law school, they're all whacked in the head, right? Well, Not all of them, most of them. I wouldn't quite say they're all the same, but if you look at the faculties of, of the major law schools from which people like President Obama are going to draw their nominees, um, yeah, essentially they're all the same. Okay, uh, we're, we're just about out of time. You had a really good piece about uh, the Supreme Court. Um, uh, I think it was called a dubious victory. Well, actually, that's about the Ninth Circuit, which is the federal court of appeals for for the Western United States, centered in California. And it's posted at Tacky Mag, right? Yes, TackyMag dot com. T a k i m a g dot com. All right, we're out of time, uh, my friend. Good to hear from you. Thanks for your opinion. I appreciate it as always. You're welcome. All right, Dr. Kevin Gutzman. There, you can read him at uh, TackyMag dot com, as he just said. Do I have enough time to squeeze this line? I can, can we move the uh, dude gear spot to the, uh, yeah, let's go. You're listening to the Mike Turk Show. On Sirius Patriot 144 and XM America Life 166.